me when to start. Is it time? My microphone is on, so I will begin. <laughs> Ready? After Elaine asked me to speak, I told her I would think about it, although I think I knew from the very beginning that I would say yes. So I drove past the Powell Farm with its brown fields. I drove around the big curve on New Chapel and, and across Cars Creek back up another hill, which I call Darden's Hill. By the time I was home, I had a title, Turkey Dressing and Sweet Potato Pie. Then I had to decide on my subject. I thought I might write about Thanksgiving traditions, and I looked in an old cookbook to find a recipe for roast turkey. In the game cookery section, I found a comment about cooking wild turkey. It said, there's a saying in Virginia, just get a husband who can kill a wild turkey. And then it read, you should catch both man and turkey in their youth, as both are easier to handle while young. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny for a cookbook. I was looking at the Progressive Farmer Southern Cookbook featuring Southern food ways. When I looked up stuffing in the index, I found C, dressing, and sure enough, there were plenty of recipes for dressing. In the real South, we don't usually say stuffing unless we're showing off. Now, to sweet potato pie. There were recipes for sweet potato pie and sweet potato custard and sweet potato pudding, but I used sweet potato pie in the title as an advertisement. Do you know Jane Eden? She works at Walmart and can usually be found all bundled up because she's been in the freezer in the bakery or she's pushing around a cart that's three times taller than she is. Every month, each employee chooses an item as her special. If more of that item is sold that month, the employee wins a prize. This month, Jane Eden chose sweet potato pie. So if you like that kind of dessert, or even if it's not your favorite, please buy one at Walmart. You'll be helping out one of our friends. End of commercial. When I was little, in the fourth grade, Louise Farmer was my teacher. She was the mother of Mary Sue Dodd. Mrs. Farmer was kind of stern, but certainly not as scary as Mrs. Duffy, my third grade teacher. Thanks to Mrs. Duffy, I'm still really good at math, but I learned the multiplication tables out of total fear. One of the best things about Mrs. Farmer was that she loved to read and she encouraged us to read also. I'm not sure now whether she read to us a long narrative poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but I know that at least she told us the story. The courtship of Miles Standish shared a lot about the Pilgrim Fathers, but it focused, of course, on that brave man, Miles Standish. Despite his bravery, he fell in love with pretty Priscilla Mullins. Picture her in a plain black dress with white cuffs, a white collar, a white apron, and a small white cap. Very pristine. Captain Standish was wearing armor. There were Indians around, of course. There was also the best friend of Miles Standish, and his name was John Alden. He was dressed just like the salt and pepper shakers in TV commercials that you see at this time of year. I don't know if Longfellow actually described all of that or not. Maybe the pictures in books reinforced the idea, but certainly we couldn't have Googled how they looked. Anyhow, Miles Standish loved Priscilla, he was a brave soldier, but he trembled at the thought of talking to her. He sort of sounds like Moses, I think. Like Moses, he had to have help in delivering his message. So he asked John Alden, his best friend, to talk to Priscilla. And John Alden did. 
Unfortunately for Miles Standish, Priscilla was smitten with John Alden, and when he ended his speech on behalf of Miles Standish, she looked at him coyly is the right word here. She looked at him coyly and said, why don't you speak for yourself, John? And John Alden did speak. He loved her too. Poor Miles Standish. I did wonder how the whole thing worked out. And because now in 2019 we can Google, I did. Miles Standish was a real person and a true soldier. He did fight the Indians, but he also worked with Squanto to save the colonists. He did find a wife. Her name was Barbara, but she died in the terrible winter of 1620-21. Priscilla's parents and a brother died during that winter also. She had already married John Alden by that time. And Miles Standish remarried. Her name was Rose, and they had 11 children. You know, I fuss a lot about technology, especially when I don't understand it. But Google is truly wonderful. It surely beats carrying around the S volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica all of the time. Of course, as fourth graders, we didn't know much about the personal lives of Miles, Priscilla, and John Alden. We did like the story, and I suspect that we went around saying, why don't you speak for yourself, John, until Mrs. Farmer nearly went crazy. And even more exciting than that romantic story, remember having a sweetheart when you were in the fourth grade? Romance. Even more than that romantic story was the fact that Mrs. Farmer assigned us to be Priscilla or Miles or John Alton or Squanto. And so we did. It was an era of liking your teacher and wanting to please her. Our parents were also on her side. We gathered at Main Street School in our classroom upstairs. We squealed and laughed at our costumes and then had our picture made on the steps of the Holland Apartments on the Locust Street side of the building. Pictures still exist and are shared now and then on Facebook. Bob Calloway, who would become a banker in Knoxville, was John Alden. I was Priscilla Mullins and stood beside him on, you guessed it, the front row. Frank Dodson was in his mild Standish armor. Frank became a doctor and died suddenly when he was rather young. Jewel Doris was an Indian, war paint and a feather stuck onto a construction paper headband. One didn't worry about being politically correct about Native Americans during those years. After the pictures, we walked downtown and were welcomed by the businesses up and down Main Street. We stopped at Shannon's drugstore for ice cream cones. That was our pilgrimage for the day. I will say that I was disappointed years later to find that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was not considered a major poet. I had learned to like him. Thanks to Mrs. Farmer, the pilgrims were more real to us after that class. The story, the history of religious freedom was a good one, but it happened so far away. We did go to our choice of church on Sunday, but that was all that religious freedom meant to us when we were fourth graders. None of us could guess how deeply some of us had been touched by religious freedom. Many of us had Moravians on our family trees. Moravians right here in Robertson County. And you may be thinking, oh no, Charlotte, Moravians again? But yes, Moravians again. They too were persecuted for their religion, and their response was started by John Huss in early 15th century Bohemia. Today, that's the Czech Republic. And the Bohemians are not those that we think of today, the gypsies or the poor writers, cold and starving in an attic in France but writing nevertheless, not those Bohemians. Huss and his followers had trouble with the Roman Catholic Church. They wanted services to be celebrated in Czech, not Latin. They wanted an end to indulgences. You remember indulgences provided a way to stay out of purgatory. You pay the Pope or his representative and you don't have to go. The Moravians didn't believe in purgatory either. 
This was about a century before Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, by the way. Huss himself attended a religious gathering where he was condemned as a heretic and burned at the stake in July 1436. Still, the Moravian movement continued. They had to go underground for a while in northern Europe, but the movement went on, and one of the things that is most important to us was their belief in missions. From Germany, they sent out missionaries to the Caribbean, to North and South America, the Arctic, Africa, and the Far East. They were the first to send lay people as missionaries and the first Protestant denomination to minister to slaves. In 1741, they established a mission in the colony of Pennsylvania. It was started on Christmas Eve, and so they named the mission Bethlehem, today the seventh largest city in Pennsylvania. Nazareth, Pennsylvania soon followed. From there, missions were founded in North Carolina. One large tract of land was purchased and named Wachau or Wachovia after an estate on the Danube River in Austria. It had been the ancestral estate of one of the Moravian leaders. Early, other early settlements were Bethabara in 1753 and Salem in 1766. Salem is now referred to as Old Salem in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The Moravians were moving closer. Meanwhile, there was John Wesley. In late 1735, he was on a ship moving from England toward the New World. Wesley had been invited to serve as pastor to Savannah, Georgia, which was still a British colony. On board was a company of Moravians, whom Wesley often referred to as Germans. There was a terrible storm at sea, and Wesley feared for his life. He noticed that the Germans, who were on their way to preach to American Indians, did not seem afraid at all. In fact, they were singing. When the trip ended, Wesley asked the leader about their serenity. The Moravian leader asked a question of Wesley. Do you have faith in Christ? Wesley said that he did, but later thought, I fear they were vain words. He was confused by the experience, and this led to some soul-searching and ultimately to the gathering where his heart was strangely warmed. It led to Methodism. The Moravians are frequently mentioned in the journals of John Wesley, and they kept journals, and they too kept journals and lists. Their list of what men came to Bethabara, for example, of whom they married, of when they died. Joseph Jacob Kopp, for example, was born in Minkenstein, Switzerland in 1729. His last name is spelled K-A-P-P. -P. He was still single when he arrived at Bethlehem in 1754. He was a tuner and a miller and was selected as one of 22 single brethren to start a settlement at Christian Spring, Pennsylvania. Five years later, he was one of eight asked to go to the new Moravian town of Bethabara in western North Carolina. He was part of a carefully drawn plan. He was a skilled woodworker like his father and in 1755 was operating the first grist mill in northwest North Carolina. Cobb cared for refugees during the French and Indian War, mostly those seeking protection from the Cherokees. During the American Revolution, he provided grain for both sides, although he was partial to the Patriots. After the war, he returned to his trade. He never had much money. As a Moravian, he turned his profits back to the church. Everyone worked to see that all people in the community were provided with what they needed. This man, whose parents had fled religious persecution, was a miller, and the tradition was carried on for five generations. His oldest son, however, was Frederick Kopp, and he went to Tennessee in 1794. It wasn't even Tennessee then. A community of Moravians settled a bit west of where Springfield is now located. The Fries, the Pfizers, and the Kopps lived in the area bounded by the old Cooperstown Road, 
now New Chapel, Cars Creek, and Clue Allen. They wanted a church, of course, and the group first met in the home of Peter Fizer. If you go out on New Chapel, cross the bridge, go up Darden's Hill, a little back from the road on the right was the Fizer's home. Now, there used to be a church near the road, and some of you may remember it. I do. That was not the old Dutch chapel where the Moravians worshipped. Peter Fizer's home was further back, and the old Dutch chapel was built after they needed more room. It was made of logs. The old Dutch chapel, Dutch really meaning Deutsch, I think, because I'm sure a good many of them spoke German. The old Dutch chapel was also outgrown, and so they needed a new chapel. And the new chapel Methodist church is the one that was located right beside the road. The road became New Chapel Road. There is also Cage Ellis Road that connects New Chapel with Highway 49. I remember when it was Cobb Road because the Cobb family owned land nearby. In Peter Pfizer's line, there was a descendant named Solomon Pfizer. You ever heard of him? He lived three miles west of Springfield and owned a sawmill as well as a lot of farmland. Solomon Pfizer married Zelica Hutchison, and in our sanctuary, a window was dedicated to her by her daughters who attended this church. It's the one where the woman is clinging to the cross. My devotion book yesterday read, Our ancestors' choices affected our lives before we were born. They lived their lives in a way that honored Jesus and in turn laid the foundation for us to build a relationship with him. When we decide to follow Jesus, we are shaping not only our future, but future generations as well. Our prayers for them will echo throughout history and link them to Jesus, the one who loves them most of all. Amazing, from Bohemia to Switzerland and Germany to Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Robertson County, we have been blessed by our goodly heritage. It's a happy Thanksgiving story to tell. Thank you, Charlotte. Sure. I, I could just listen to her read off a menu. <laughs> <laughs> it's just good to listen How to, nice. no matter what. How nice. I will say that... Um, the Moravians, I have some patients that are Pfizer's. There's still several in the area. And are there any Cobbs left? Or, yes, yeah, several. Yeah. yeah, okay. And, and their line goes right and back And they're there. descended Who from. Yeah. 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 It's just pretty cool to connect um, all of that history yeah. together. Thank you for doing that. Um, that probably took, would take me a long time, but you probably gathered that in, in a few short hours. And so uh, we are grateful for her ability to do that. And so you just can have a program anytime you want it. Um, so, uh, and, and she does this for, if, if anybody wants to go with their senior adults when we go around to all the different area churches, this is a taste of it. So if you're wondering why that's the most attended senior adult group trip, it's, that's why. Um, so come and join us. Uh, I will, I will um, adjust the age requirements if anybody wants to go on that. Um, but let's, let's finish with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, again, thank you for this time of, of smiles and laughter and imagery and poetry and history and just this, this gathering of, of your children. And so we think about the old days. We think about all of the intricate things that happened in your divine plan to put us right here in this place at this time and all of the people that have come before us and how we're all interconnected. And so we're just grateful when we think about our history and about the future that you have for us and how one day we will be um, spoken about and uh, studied historically. And we're just, we're, we're glad we're in a timeline, but we're also glad that you are eternal. There is no beginning and end with you. 
and you see everything and know everything and love us unconditionally. So we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.